Hello, I'm Simon from Kent Libraries and this is On The Books, the library show born out of lockdown that talks about all things written word. Thoughts, ideas, inspirations and much, much more. So, sit back, relax and enjoy the conversation. Joining us today we have Julia Gray, author, musician and fan of Metallica. Hello and welcome to our little slice of Canterbury Library, our new digital area. Um, with me today I have Julia Gray, who is a songwriter, uh, author, has been uh, gigged, has written a play, all-round creative person. Um, I'm in awe and it's really nice to have you here. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. You are more than welcome. And first of all, how's it all going? Oh gosh, well, it's uh, it's quite nice to be having a summer holiday, I have to say, because as well as I'm writing, I'm also a teacher and um, I found the whole of the summer term quite long and stressful as we all did. So I'm, I'm kind of enjoying taking a little break actually from that. And uh, I'm very well and primarily super excited about um, publication day for my book, I Ada, because it's coming up really soon and I keep having to pinch myself to remind myself <laughs> that it's coming up so immediately. We're really looking forward to it, I have to say. Um, we have it all on order for the library, so we're waiting for our copies to arrive, so that should be good. Uh, oh, I want so to get good. my hands on it, I won't lie. Um, so yeah, what we talk about on, on, on these uh, little interviews is mainly just sort of the written word and, and inspiration and, and it's kind of like why you do what you do, really. So. Um, I like to start off with with the first question that is sometimes considered cruel, but but um, uh, I start with it anyway. Um, and this is what book changed your life? Any age? Any age? I would any say age whatsoever. How many answers can I give you? You can give as many as you like. It's fine. I think I'll start with a book by Diana Wynne Jones called mm -hmm. Fire and Hemlock which I first read when I was about 12. And I think I was probably a bit young for it just because it's quite a complex book. I think now it would probably be marketed as YA. I think then in, when there's probably the late 90s or whatever, I, whenever I read it, um, why mid 90s why it wasn't a thing so um, um but it spans an extraordinary length of time because it's set over 10 years and it's a friendship between a girl and a cellist and it's it's a works in a variety of different ways because it uses intertexts it uses um three or four different other stories and it's all woven together it's a very complicated book but i i keep going back to it and i always have gone back to it and um, because there's just something incredibly powerful about the writing, about the way when Jones uses all these other stories. Um, and I never fully feel like I've got to the bottom of that book. And I think <laughs> books that change you are the ones that challenge you to keep returning to them because you want to find out more. Um, I would say for exactly the same reasons, Robber Bride, The Robber Bride by Margaret Atwood. Yep. Um, which uh, obviously it's a grown-up book, but it inspired uh, an album that I wrote called Robber Bride. Um, that book, I think, again, I read it probably when I was too young to read it, and it changed the way I thought about relationships. Um, and the third book that I will pick, because I've just randomly <laughs> decided to give you three, uh, I read it a couple of years ago, and it's called A Brief History of Myth, or A Short History of Myth, I can't remember which one, and the author is Karen Armstrong. Um, and it's quite a short book, um, but it's just the history of mythology. And it changed, it changed me profoundly the moment I read it because uh, I realised how important myth really is to us and how we need to keep connecting to it. Myth, they, yeah, they're, they're, that is the story of, of us, isn't it, really? And, and how we've uh, assessed and learnt the world and, and explained things. And yeah, myths are amazing things. I, 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 I agree. I just read um, Neil Gaiman's North Mythology, the, the, um, the Norse Mythology, the rewriting of some of the Norse myths. And I know exactly what you mean. It's amazing storytelling, just some of the, how we connect to the mythology that we came from. So yeah, I see your choice of that one. And I think I'll have to go and read that myself. Um, oh yeah, I okay. recommend it. Because I'm in a library and, and I have to promote libraries, um, of course. So I always ask, what are your memories of uh, public libraries and what they mean to you? Public libraries as opposed to school libraries. Oh, well, it could be a school library. Any libraries. libraries. Any libraries library. have, oh gosh, libraries have been important to me 
for my whole life. I mean, I suppose I'm thinking ch childhood, it would be school libraries at first because I, I grew up in Belgium, I in Brussels. I don't even know, I don't know where the public library was in Brussels, but certainly my school library was super important. And I remember every year they would have a book fair and it was my favorite day of the whole year when all these books would come in from goodness knows where and you'd sit there and read them and ask them find out new things and ask to buy as many as you can um school libraries have always been important to me but as i've as an adult of course it's public libraries that have kind of taken their place and when i was writing little liar which i can see behind <laughs> your head i wrote that in two libraries in queen's park library and kilburn library which are the ones nearest to where i live i'm so grateful to those libraries for just being there because it was super important to me that i had somewhere to go to work on them um and when i was writing ada i ada rather um the british library was my home that's where i worked because i would quite often need um, something very esoteric that I could only get the British Library and I'd be able to order it and I could could have a look at it, photocopy it, do it, use it for my research, but it's also just a really nice place to, to work. And the Bodleian Library in Oxford um, is the place that houses the Lovelace Byron papers, which I needed access to in order to continue my research. So I would say like I mean there's no better place than a library and I'm not just saying that because <laughs> you're a librarian. <laughs> Well, I agree with you, but I work in one, so I... I <laughs> biased. <laughs> a little bit. The only drawback to working in a library is you are surrounded by all these wonderful books and never have time to read them. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> it's like torture. It's like, what's new? Oh, sorry, I have to do it. But no, um, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you said that about libraries without any um, about prompting, so that's always good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think... Obviously, COVID, um, we can't not touch upon COVID and, and 2020, um, the planet on fire. It's 2020 has been a year on hard, I think, would probably be the description I would uh, go with. So I think what we've all had to deal with new technologies and new, new ways of dealing with things. Um, but I am curious, as a writer, we are now in an age of devices. Uh, as I was growing up, these mythical things were, ne were never... Uh, as prominent as they are now and now they are everywhere we all carry a computer in our pockets so do you think that written word still has a place in an age of devices or, or how we promote the written word do you mean writing by hand specifically um or... well, writing by hand or just in general books and print the printed press or, or i mean ebooks are, are fantastic but I, I see a lot of people that are glued to their phones if you see what i mean um and do we still have a place for that stopping oh, yeah reading I, I think we do and i think i mean i'm not a children's publisher but i am pretty reliably informed that children and young adults prefer to read a physical book than to read it on their phone or their kindle i personally love kindles and uh, <laughs> kindle app on my phone purely because um where we we have no more space for books so we've, we've bought so many there is we can't physically fit anymore in our house so I will quite happily read on my phone um but I think there will always be a longing to have for people to have their artifacts in their hands the cover you know to be able to write notes in it I I don't think we'll ever fall out of love with it oh yeah I'm, I'm, I would hope so being that I work in a library and I always want physical books I mean ebooks have definitely have their place you're right the kindle is a fantastic I personally take my kindle whenever I'm journeying anywhere because it's mm. so much easier to carry oh yeah many books with you but yes um I'm glad that people still think the written word is important and reading is important and kids definitely um definitely are eating up uh, the written word. So that's good, that's good. We're not there yet where we I remember when they released a kid, I said, oh, it will be the death of books. It hasn't happened, so that's yeah. good. Um, in a, a sort, of, a sort of marching on from that one, really, a little bit, um, mental health is very important in, in, in now and the recognition of mental health, and I think that's a fantastic thing. So as a writer, how do you think reading uh, and uh, helps with or can benefit mental health, especially of sort of teens and, and younger people? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, I mean, 
certainly sort of self-help or spiritual literature is one avenue to go down there are so many books out there that can just especially if you find the right one the right author um can help you to feel better about yourself about the world um or any kind of non-fiction really that just gives you that sense of comfort and connection to things it could even be sort of holistic eating or yoga or anything like that there are just so many books out there for whatever it is that you need to find out but in terms of fiction i think sometimes just getting out of your own head and into someone else's experiences is one of the most healing things that, that you can do um i always go back to i reread actually when i'm feeling at a low ebb and i go back to the books um i, I reread agatha christie's actually because i know them so well <laughs> and they're my they're my comfort stone and i and you know so during during the whole of lockdown i must have reread about you know 35 agatha christie's because it was safe um and so I, I think there's i think there's manifold ways that books and reading can help with mental health and also i think avoiding the things that that you don't want to read about and don't want to engage with knowing what what things will and not will and won't work for you i think yeah i completely agree i think yeah it's it's a bit of knowing yourself but also books give you that opportunity just to discover things that you wouldn't necessarily think about or it invites you to think about things that, and escape so yeah I, I i i very much agree with what you've just said um so you're very creative you you've written albums you've been in bands um uh you've written a play which is always amazes me anyone who writes a play especially about trotsky so there we go um, wow <laughs> That's uh, some good research you've managed to do there. <laughs> I was very young at the time. I was about 17. I haven't written one since. I wish I had. <laughs> we tried to do our research. I do have a library to hand. It does help. I, of course you do. <laughs> um, so I suppose my question is, when did you know you wanted to be a writer? I mean, I know you've been writing music for a very long time. So, but even songwriting or, um, or, or the uh, author, um, when did you know you wanted to be a writer? Um, I was, I was, I think, very young, and this is certainly what I think is the case: is that my dad is a writer, and um, I lived in this house in Belgium, and on the stairs, uh, the big, wide staircase, and on it were all of his framed book jackets. Now he basically wrote mixture of fiction and non-fiction, so he wrote some thrillers, and some um, sort of texts about like the environment mostly and world population things like that but I remember just thinking it was the most glamorous thing the most amazing thing I'd ever seen all these framed book jackets as I went you know aged about three or four up and down the stairs and I'm sure that and also I would see him writing I would see him at work on his really old Amstrad well I mean it was new at the time but now very old and you know with the black screen and the black green, with the green. Cursor. yeah yeah he had one of those and I thought it was amazing I, I i was just totally bowled over by how wonderful it looked and that was what i wanted to do so is that um, where your love for the written word came from from your dad oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that makes sense oh sure yeah i suppose you, you saw the process of writing which which fascinates me the process of writing um which kind of does lead me on to to, to so i don't do very much writing um in, in the sense that, that you do, I do a little bit, but, but nothing. But I, um, but I've always been told by people who do write, my writer friends. So I'm going to ask you this question: the dreaded white blank page or screen. How do you overcome the fear or the the that that first initial blank page? You, oh gosh, um, okay. So there is one thing that helps me um and i started doing this when i was writing little liar um with and i started little liar up in a beautiful interdisciplinary artists and writers retreat in scotland called cove park and i i was very lucky that i was invited to go there and i was quite pregnant and and i said i was quite worried about being there because it's it's quite it's literally just a bed and a desk and a little fridge and you were just in a kind of white box for three weeks with basically like no phone and no internet. And I was very anxious about whether or not I could actually do anything when I got there. Um, and yet I turned up and sure enough, there was indeed a, the dreaded sort of white blank screen. And what I started doing then, and I still do it now, is I wrote a diary. So I just had a had an open document 
in my Scrivener binder. And if, and I would, I would, as I was writing or thinking about, I would record how I was feeling. And often I do that first thing in the morning. And I just, I'd sometimes just say, you know, I'm in a terrible fugue state and I just can't do this. And the moment that I'd managed to say that I could kind of park it and dive into what I really needed to do. And now I do the same thing. I just keep a diary. I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not fancy and it's mostly just a record of, of misery, woe and occasional (laughs) flashes of hope, but it's very useful for for me to do that. So the diaries are a really good um, segue into what what I want to ask you next, actually. So people who want to start writing, because obviously at some point someone's going to take the plunge and they go, actually, I do want to do this. What advice can you give them for, for actually starting the, the process of becoming a writer? What, did, what, did, what was your experience and, and what advice can you give? Okay, so for everyone's experience is different. Everyone's needs are different. But mm-hmm. for me, I didn't write very much at all between the ages of 16 and 29. I... I was completely devoted to music I wrote lyrics I didn't write anything longer than a whatever essay I might have had to do for school but I didn't I didn't try and write fiction you know I I was totally absorbed in music and then it kind of hit me that no I really do want to write books I have no idea how so um something that I did which you do not have to do but I did it and it was very useful was I took myself back to university and I went to Birkbeck and I studied creative writing so I I did a diploma in children's literature and then I did a master's in creative writing Mm. um for me it was very useful to study it to do it in a slightly academic way to have a tutor to have colleagues to be kind of supervised to have schedules I had to write because I had to hand in my homework Um, but if you weren't to go down that route and you don't have to at all by any means I would definitely recommend reading some memoirs um some writers on writing so Margaret Atwood writes about writing very compellingly Stephen King obviously has written one of the bibles um (laughs) part memoir part writer's toolkit um George George Orwell I mean you can you can make a big collection of writers on writing and just to and see these little inroads insights into how they work it can I think probably be enough to trigger your own ability to get started i once got got given some advice by neil gaiman i had the joy of meeting him at a uh, a book signing and i was saying you know how 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 do you and he just said write just just keep writing just just keep writing it doesn't matter if you ever see the light of day just keep writing and then he went keep reading (laughs) that's kind of interesting What you were saying about in a that. nutshell definitely <laughs> just read everything um yeah, yeah i see what you're saying about the memoirs that that's that's a that's a really good piece of advice um so i'm actually that not leads me on to want to ask you so where do you get inspired what what's your well obviously you write uh, music as well what's where do you get your inspiration from now that is not an easy question but what inspires you to to write okay very good question so my first book, The Other Life, was a kind of cocktail of things that interested me deeply. Norse mythology, yep. Metallica, yep. Um, and I suppose education, which by that point in my life, I'd seen a lot of one way or the other. And those three things came together. Um, and I enjoy, and, and it's the same process, actually, that I sometimes use when I'm writing an album, as I start thinking about three albums that I... I might think, okay, so there's Joni Mitchell's Blue, there's yep. Tom Waits, and, there's, and, and I, I kind of want to do something that does a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and I'm going to kind of make a cocktail of them. And that's how The Other Life came about, was me kind of mixing things together that I loved. Little Liar, that was the book I wrote in Scotland, came out of more or less nowhere. Mm. I started with, with a one-line what-if which was what if you were a terrible liar and everything, all the lies you told had triggered something terrible. Um, I started there and the book came from there. Um, And so in that sense, it was inspired by panic and just (laughs) having having three weeks to try and produce lots of words. Now, Ada was um, rather lovely because I didn't have to try and be inspired. The premise was there. The structure was there. All I had to do was 
review the wealth of material that there is about Ada and try and decide how I would tell her tale. And then, of course, along the way, there were these kind of micro inspirations, like I'd dive down a rabbit hole about shorthand or I'd get really re start reading up on the allotment movements in Britain or whatever it is that I needed to find out about, which was very inspiring. But Ada herself was the kind of umbrella for that one. So I didn't have to kind of try too hard to be inspired. Um, Ada is, is due out in September. Um, so give us a, a rough idea of what Ada is about. Tell us what the new one is. So it's it is the um it's an exploration of the teenage years of Ada Lovelace. Now we know that Ada's incredible achievement, the thing that she is now known for, that didn't actually happen until she was sort of 26, 27. But this is a young adult book. So I had to sort of I was I, I wasn't going to go that far. Um, so when we first meet Ada, she is 20 and she has gone to the Royal Academy and she's looking at a portrait of her that has been painted and she is staring at it. She suddenly and she wonders, is this it? Is this the person that I am, wife and mother? Or is it possible that I could be something different? And she walks out of the gallery, goes for a walk. And the rest of the novel is basically told in flashbacks as she remembers her life up to that point, her education, her relationship with her mother, her longing to know more about notorious Lord Byron, her absent <laughs> father, then her dead father. She never yeah. knew him. She never met him. I mean, she did when she was born but other than that she didn't so um it's it's a bit of a coming of age story yeah. it's a bit of a mystery story because she has these enormous questions about her parents and what happened in their marriage that ultimately get more or less answered um and it's also the story of how she came to possess the kind of brain and aptitude that allowed her to basically foresee the modern computer yeah um so it's all of it's all of those things. There's a bit of romance. <laughs> There's a lot of Ada talking about having ideas and her imagination and her brain. Because I was very in awe of her brain. Mm. I mean, I think she must have been just the most extraordinary person. Um, and uh, and yeah, there's a you know some other little you know there's Charles Charles Babbage is in there. <laughs> Charles Dickens is in one page. <laughs> Mary Somerville, very important. So there's other figures from the time. I have to say, we're really looking forward to it. I'm, I'm personally looking forward to getting my hands on it. I know it's it's meant to be teen fiction, but I don't think anyone can enjoy um, a good book. So I have to say, I am looking forward to getting my hands on it. Um, because of, uh, uh, you write quite complicated books, uh, or they, they've been described as complicated. Um, the plots are, are not off, often straightforward. Um, you, you trust your audience to go along with you. So I suppose my question would be, do you think there is a tendency to, to not, I don't want to say look down, but underestimate the teenage audience for what content of books or the audience is full stop, you know, because you quite often get the, uh, it's too complicated for these people. So, so what, what do you, what's your feeling on that? I think there are books for everyone. Yeah. And I, I don't think that people underestimate teen readers. Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I, um, but uh, what was I going to say? I don't. Um, me probably making my plots complicated is more probably because I'm confused by them than because I'm trying to make them complicated. <laughs> it's probably just I baffled myself with too many twists and turns. I'm not. I'm not very good at plotting. I find it very difficult because I think it just it uses whatever side of the brain, the left side of the brain, I'd much rather just write freely and be dictated to by by the elements and the ether and then suddenly they oh but wait i have to somehow link these things together and this has this cause has to have a consequence and i find it very difficult actually <laughs> okay um so i wanted to ask you about little liar actually because um nora a character that up front tells you she is a liar from the beginning you know um awesome idea because she's not likable in the traditional sense but you do root for her even though she is a totally well she lies about every the little things the big things everything mm -hmm. so i have to ask how did you make an unlikable character in in quotation marks work because you do root for her but you know even though even though she is quite horrible in many ways 
I'm really glad you root for her. And I think I can answer a slightly different question, which is just that um, whenever I ch try to write a likable main character, it just doesn't work. Right. It just falls completely flat. And for some reason, I find it much easier to give a voice to you know, characters who are a little bit immoral or they do see the worst in other people or they do think terribly negative. So I just find it much easier. I don't know why. And I wish it, you know, I wish that I could actually write nice of main characters. I'm hoping that Ada will come across quite nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose I would, I would argue, and I'm in no position to argue, but I would argue that the reality is that we're all complicated and we do mm. root for the people who are complicated. Overly simplified good guys are just that. They're, they're caricatures. They don't yeah. age quite the same way. I mean, yep. you do remember the villains. I mean, I'm thinking about this. You do remember the villains predominantly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, I mean, Thor in Norse mythology is kind of okay, but Loki... Loki. Loki, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to ask this question because we mentioned the band at the beginning and I, I'm, I'm going to get you on tape doing this. Metallica songs, your top three. Okay, so, um, see, I really love For Him the Bell Tolls. Right, okay. Um, I have a, there's a whole paragraph devoted to it in The Other Life. I love Orion. Yeah from Master of Puppets. I love that hugely. Only one more. <laughs> I don't want to say the wrong one here. Um, there is Because no I one. feel like, yeah, but I'm going to, wait, I've, so, so um, Orion and For Whom the Bell Tolls, I think those are good choices. And I feel like I want to have something I don't know if I was just listening to The Outlaw Torn this morning, but I'm not going to say that one because <laughs> I don't think it would count. As I, I think we'll, I think I'll say Sad But True okay. because it's in drop D. Yes. Uh, so it's just so dark. <laughs> and so it's such a, it's so much fun, that song. How about, and how about, can I ask you for yours too? Just to like, not keep well, asking you the same questions. Uh, yeah, no, it's fine. Um, oh, okay. So... The song that blew me away and I will listen to over and over again is one. In fact, that, that yeah. is one. Yeah. Pick up a bass guitar, which is kind of insane. Mm. Um, I'm with you on Orion. Once again, Orion, just I close my eyes and I go on a journey. I think that is yeah. beautifully written. What a song. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely no lyrics, but but just every time. Yeah, uh, you, just don't, you just don't need them. There's nothing. You, no, don't... you get the middle section and I am in the galaxy. It was just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so all uh, right, and like you, now I'm now going to go for a third one. Oh, that is that is, um, uh, yeah. See, that's <laughs> oh yeah. Now I realize how hard a question it was. You know, I should have said. I maybe I should have said actually something from. I maybe I should have said Harvester of Sorrow. I'm see, thinking. I would be with you with Harvester of Sorrow. Mm. The tune for Harvester of Sorrow always. Catches. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if I was going to go for something later. I am actually quite a fan of the Memory Remains. Yep, yeah, it's a, it's a great song. In fact, I think that's one of the first. No, not true, because Load was the first album I ever listened to. But it's really good. The Memory Remains. Yeah, I, 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 I um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, it's a real, real crowd pleaser. But actually, yeah, the sentiment behind it is quite clever as well. Mm, so mm. Um, yeah, so there you go. That's that's, that's yeah, that was a good choice actually. Because if you're ever, you know, if you're ever watching Metallica live. Like you say, the, the audience just loves the memory remains because they can all do it. Like the they can all do it. Marianne Could Faithful, but well. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the list is the list is very long. It's probably it easier to list the ones you don't like. <laughs> yeah, probably. yeah, probably. Actually, it's like which which all of them except for a couple. And then when you added <laughs> the orchestra behind them, I ended up liking them too. Like the thing that should not be. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Apple yeah. album, but the. The Sid New York, the S&M version. Yes, yes, the S&M version, yes. It's unbelievable. Yeah, we mm. probably shouldn't talk about music anymore. It should be more about books. <laughs> Almost not less about Metallica. I'm, I'm, I'm actually curious, because you obviously said you, you were used to writing lyrics before you got into writing novels. Is there a crossover between writing lyrics mm. and writing novels? I, I'm just curious what, what that would be. Great question. Yeah, I mean, I think... For me, um, lyrics tend to rely hugely on metaphor. And that's something that you can import 
fairly directly into prose fiction, obviously rhyme less so. But yeah. even now, um, when I write, um, this can be really hard to explain. So um, <laughs> I, it, when I write anything that's a long piece of fiction, I still hear it as music first. Mm. Uh, or perhaps more clearly I hear a rhythm and it's quite a specific rhythm um, and I have to create words that will fit with the rhythm so uh, and I presumably I do that because I've spent such a long time writing lyrics and so that still is my process yeah. even now okay. I think one of the hardest um, transition issues is to do with form because you can write a set of lyrics in in an hour you can write a set of lyrics in half an hour you know um you can have a finished album of certainly in terms of concept in a week you might spend two or three years working on a book <laughs> so just to i found that very very difficult just to acquire the kind of patience and tenacity to be able to stick with something for so long um that that was the hardest thing that, that that makes perfect sense. Uh, yes, I, I have. Um, I was speaking to, speaking to another, another writer, and I say you're working like two years in advance. You, you you've, you've got stuff that that is due out in a year's time or a two years time that you're working on, rather than so. Whenever you're talking about a book that's come out, the work's been done long before the actual material appears. Um, so yeah, I, I've never thought. I suppose it's a bit like filmmaking in that respect. You're talking. You are talking a long time down the line before yeah. what you produce is actually there to the world. Yeah. Um, and yet they still managed to hit the zeitgeist. I don't know how you writers do that, but that's quite good. Uh, no, no, no <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, so I'd like to ask this question, and I, I will answer it myself if, 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 if need be. If there was any one book or a couple you wish you could have written, what would it be? I think that Dodie Smith's 101 Dalmatians is... I just the most amazing book it's so extraordinary it's there's no book like it reading it as an adult which I do occasionally do I realized that it's actually a book not about dogs at all but about family yeah. togetherness and what you would do to protect your family it's also beautifully written it's got so many ideas kind of bubbling beneath the surface it's funny it's sad it's Christmassy. I just love it so much. <laughs> so that's the that's the off the top of my head answer, and therefore probably uh, probably the true one. Probably the true one. The how one how about you? Can you? Uh, what's your answer to that question? Um, yeah, I can answer it straight away. Um, and it was for one line actually in it. Um, Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere. I, the mm. first time I ever read that. Um, I, it's not a book that changed my life, but it is a book that something just clicked, and I went. I wish, I just wish I'd had the mind that, that produced. And it was for the line, it wasn't so much that they turned, uh, the, uh, the um, darkness, uh, sorry, the light was turned down, the darkness was turned up mm. and it was crossing the Knights Bridge. I mean, yeah, just, yeah, th that, that's mine. That, that was it, that was the line. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was Neverwhere by, by Neil Gaiman. Um, but there are many books that I, um, that I, I, that have changed my life and there are many books that I will always return to, but I won't bore them with my opinions. I'm, it's much more about yours than, than, than what I'm saying. Although I will say that I read Lord of the Rings once a year, every year. Uh, oh, wow. Well, of course. I also watch all the films. Uh, the, the, really, the really long, the, the, the whatever, the, the, what's the, the very long versions because it's just the, so well. Um, are they oh, yes. the director's cut or are they the... They extend, yeah. Um, the extend, extended cuts, extended yeah. Cut. Yeah, the, when you put them all together, you're talking about 11 and a half Yeah, hours. yeah, yeah. And then you watch them in two days. It's a watch in a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I'm going off the topic of my own questions here. I'm just going on to a general conversation about everything. Um, I do like to ask this one because um, I just find the answer interesting. How do you organise or do you organise your bookshelves? Gosh, um, I sort of do. So <laughs> they are supposed to be done fairly kind of, you know, like fiction is in one place, non-fiction is another place, a foreign language, you know, it's, it's supposed to be like that. In general, though, it all 
becomes a bit bit chaotic and muddled but i mean i do i do try i did i did go through the phase that everyone went through of having it all done by color and then i decided that wasn't very useful really <laughs> it's nothing is alphabet nothing is alphabetized i hate i hasten to say which is very sad i know um but i do i do try and and keep like books together no, that makes sense that makes sense we all have a, a process my process is is they're there the, the, on my shelves, I don't. My shelves are a disaster, so I can't ever, ever criticise anyone for being chaotic. Although the library obviously is well organised, I think it's yeah. a reaction to the library. Um, oh yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has to all be organised, but yeah, at home. I think I've got my go-to books in one shelf, and then the other stuff sort of dotted all over. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? I think the fact is, if they're your books, it's your home. You know where they are. Yeah. It doesn't really matter if, you know, and sometimes the crazy juxtapositions can be quite um, amusing in themselves. That's true. That's very true. Um, <laughs> like, why is Dickens next to self-help? That makes no sense whatsoever. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> How, I, I'm actually curious because you, you said you did a master's in creative writing and you said that really helped you. Um, um, organize how you write yourself so w was it the process of being taught it specifically you, you mentioned because um, I've never gone through it of being taught how to write so I, I, I'm, I've never done any masters on creative writing or anything like that so I'm just curious what, what about it was was um, helpful I suppose is is I think in a nutshell, yes, it was being taught mm. how to. And because over, I've actually managed to be there for three years altogether doing sort of two different degrees. I'm talking about Birkbeck College, which I yeah. think is the most incredible institution. So you're going to do all these different modules like screenwriting or writing for young adults, or you could do poetry, you could do short stories. So, you know, I had various different tutors and from each of these tutors, you'd learn something different mm. about how to write something you hadn't thought about before. Then there's the element of ha homework. So you have to write something yourself. You've got to produce it, send it to everyone. Then it will be um, critiqued by the room, which is very strange um, yeah. sensation, but then you become quite addicted to it. Um, so it's very collaborative actually. And you've got sort of 18 people all talking about, whether they think it worked that you use this line in a particular place. And it's, um, it's quite forensic um, and you, you can feel very sort of on the spot, but actually it's, uh, it's quite alchemical and quite interesting. And you come away wanting to improve, it fills you with a desire, I think, to, to work at it and to get better and to keep reading and to keep writing more. Um, so it's really those elements, I think, it, having being in a group of people who all have the same dream, which is to be a published author, yeah. having these tutors who are able to to help you along the way um, and probably having having a structure around it as well. So, you know, for example, you've got a short story to write for Monday or a dissertation to complete by the end of the year. And to have those goals um, and that structure was something that really helped me. Am I right in thinking that you studied the classics, first of all? Is, is that correct? That's right. So my undergraduate degree is in Latin and Greek. Latin and Greek. Okay, so I have to ask this one then. Favourite Greek god? Well, I think I've always loved Athena myself. Oh. Um, who, if I was going to choose someone else, I think, it's got, I think it's just got to be her, really. It's just it's the war and the wisdom. Yep. She's... It's, it's, her, it's her sparkling eyes. It's, she's so strong. That's what I love about her. Um, how about you? What's your favourite Greek god? Oh, you need to turn it on me. That's, that's, oh. See, I, yeah. Um, I'm actually a fan of Hades because, yeah, sure. yeah um, because he's obviously quite often portrayed as the straight up villain um, in, in sort of more modern but he's a lot more nuanced. I mean, there, there, there is definitely stuff going on with Hades, reasons why he's kind of the way he is rather than I'm just a straight up villain. Um, I've never liked, um, I like complicated evil and Hades is quite complicated <laughs> evil. <Yeah. laughs> Fantastic. 
<laughs> um, yeah, so I have to say, yeah, I, I always root for the bad guys. I shouldn't do, really, should I? Um, <laughs> no, I think that's a great choice. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the Greeks are just amazing storytellers. Um, uh, and Stephen Fry, when he uh, did uh, Mythos, and, Mythos and that was just, yeah. just an awesome access into, into, into Greek mythology. Um, I wish I had studied the classics, and I didn't. So um, my undergrad was not anywhere near as, as exciting as yours, so, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I mean, first of all, it's been uh, absolutely wonderful to keep chatting to you. So, so I suppose my last sort of question is, we, um, we, we've spoken about IADA, which is which due out soon. What's next after, after that? I mean, what, 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 do you know where you're going next? So I'm one of those people, I'm very superstitious about talking about what I'm going to do Then we next. won't ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say I'm full of, full of ideas and plans to write more things fantastic well as long as we keep hearing your voice that's all that really matters as far as <laughs> I can. so i mean i think really all i've got left to say is thank you very much for joining us it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you and um i hope that we will get to speak soon thank you so very much for having me it's been great well you got to the end i hope you enjoyed our interview with julia gray her new book iada is out now available in the library where you'd expect to find all good books and as an audiobook. If you'd like more information on our digital offer, visit kent.gov.uk slash library or visit the link below. If you'd like to follow what we're up to on social media, go to our Facebook page or follow the link below. My name's Simon and I hope you've enjoyed it. Goodbye.